Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Raghuram Raju from University of Hyderabad. I am the principal investigator for the subject philosophy. This subject philosophy is going to be dealt with people drawn from all over India and abroad belonging to different branches of philosophy. I take this opportunity to welcome you to this EPG Patshala philosophy and request you to access the material which we are making it available to you. Most often we do come across this question, why philosophy? This question may not be asked today with regard to several other subjects, but then people do ask this question, why should we do philosophy? Why should we learn philosophy? Let me answer this question, though not directly, but in an indirect manner. There are profound answers to answer this question, like it deals with universal aspects of existence, it is concerning about the origin of this universe, it is concerned about what is the ultimate reality and so on. There are also popular answers to this question, such as it gives us liberation, it solves our problems and things like that. Let me ask this question, a counter question, in the context of answering the question why philosophy and that counter question is why is there an old age home and the answer is not obvious because family may be natural to human beings. But old age home is not the one which existed from time immemorial. Old age home came as a phenomenon, as a new institution in recent times. So that makes us to reflect back and then find out why did this institution called old age home came into existence. It is important to ask this question and one way of answering this question is to find out the reasons and causes for the emergence of an institution called old age home. The answer to this question, the origins for this institution called old age home can be traced to a very seminal passage in Rousseau's social contract. Let us look at this passage carefully. Rousseau says, and I quote, the most ancient of all societies and the only one that is natural is the family. And even so, the children remain attached to the father only so long as they need him for their preservation. As soon as that need ceases, the natural bond is dissolved. The children released from the obedience they owe to the father and the father released from the care he owed his children return equally to independence. If they remain united, they continue so no longer naturally but voluntarily and the family itself is then maintained only by convention." Unquote. Let us look at this passage closely. In other words, let us have a close reading of this important passage. What is there in this passage? There are two controversial subtexts in this passage. One is 
that there is only a mention of father in relation to children and not mother. So, feminists have criticized Rousseau, the modern philosopher, of indulging in patriarchal politics and gender politics. I will not go into that in a moment because there is a large body of scholarship that exposed this patriarchal or male centeredness in this indomitable modern philosopher. What I would like to draw your attention to is the following. Now, there is a transaction here. What is a transaction? The transaction is a father has to take care of his children and once they become adults then the bond is dissolved and both of them become independent they are not related to each other naturally though they may want to be related to each other through contract that's the point that is making so it is a transaction between a father and his children okay but then the problem comes when you look at the close aspect of this passage look at what can be called as a subtext of this passage and then find out that the transaction is not closed why is the transaction not closed because the father spends money on children okay but he gets nothing from them. Now, one way to understand the incompleteness of this transaction is to contrast it with a different arrangement that was there in the traditional family system. In a traditional family system, the structure is governed by circular notion of time. And what happens there? the parents take care of their children and children in turn take care of the parents when parents become old so in a crude way the transaction is closed the transaction is balanced the sheet is balanced okay but what is undertaken by somebody like Rousseau is to snap that circular notion of time and come up with half circles in a linear mode. And what is happening here? That parents or father in this context takes care of children and children in turn do not take care of their parents. And where do they go? They go to old age, home. That is the point that I want to bring to your attention. Okay. But then somebody might ask, why should parents take care of children? In this case, why should father take care of the children? Father should take care of the children because he is clearing the debt to his parents. In other words, the father is not the one to whom you have to clear your debt. That is, the children need not clear the debt to the father because father is clearing his debt to his father. So look at what is happening in this passage. In this passage, there is an active negotiation of transforming a, a circular notion of time into a linear notion of time. And why is it done? It is done because if children when they grow and then become adult and if they spend their time on taking care of their parents old parents they will not be available for production okay now production is important and you have to make sure that nobody interferes in human beings adults you know participating in production activity now look at the kind of things that are happening in this simple 
innocent looking passage which has some very very important implications in other words this is the passage in my reading that instituted the old age home that legitimized the old age home so look at the implications of this passage so old age home did not come just like that okay it has a philosophical backing okay old age home is not just a social phenomena there is a close relation between the passage from rousseau and the old age home the institution called old age home let me also you know mention in a lighter vein that after you read this passage and relate it to the the institution called old age home do you get more clarity or uh, less clarity i think that you get more clarity that is the reason why i believe that knowledge is light and ignorance is weight okay so philosophy is a subject that should make things clearer to you lighter to you okay and make things you know in a in a clearer form so that you understand many things through a simple formulas now let me now go on to reflect on two tasks philosophy traditionally performed one task is it embarked on building a new system on the basis of novel ideas there is a novel idea that came from gautama buddha he has come up with certain sayings nagarjuna built a system a philosophical system based on these new ideas there were some very important ideas that were there in the dialogues of socrates with others and plato systematically recorded them and presented to us in a systematic manner and this is actually what also happened with regard to upanishads badarayana compiled the upanishads as vedanta sutras for which shankara and others wrote commentaries this is what saint agustin and saint aquinas did to the sayings of jesus christ okay so the point that i want to make is that there are people who have visions and they may not have systematically presented those visions okay so the philosopher is the one who presents a systematic you know architecture of understanding those radical new visions so it is so a philosopher need not necessarily be the one who comes up with a new philosophy he or she may be the one who works on the ideas of others this is the one task of philosophy that we have seen in the history of mankind the other task of philosophy is to work within a system which is already there so there is a philosophical system and i rigorously systematically look at each and every concept and make an assessment about how it is whether it is as a valid reasons to ex for accepting or not no 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 not valid reason for accepting that's also one of the important things that happens so each segment of philosophy can be revisited critically so there are two tasks of of the subject one is building a system the other one is critically evaluating a system which is already there so there are three stages and sometimes two stages and sometimes just one or all in one in the process of philosophizing the stage one to recapitulate is there is a new vision of reality that is offered which is different from what was available at the time it so the different constitutes the beginning and this can be by a visionary stage two this vision or visions are presented in a systematic manner and this can be by a philosopher a philosopher of this kind is the one who constructs a system on the basis of this radically different insights which most often are path breaking there is stage 3 and the stage 3 is the system which is already there 
gets critically scrutinized. Now, in India, the philosophy comes to be often equated with darshana. Darshana meaning something which is visual. Okay. In Greek philosophy, it is considered as a love of wisdom. That is a quality. These are the two tasks philosophy played in the history of mankind. Now, let us look at the structure of the course. The course on philosophy consists of both Western philosophy and Indian philosophy. It also consists of both classical philosophy and modern philosophy. Now, let me look at the architecture of these courses. The architecture of these courses consists of four main components. One is the core of the subject philosophy, the balconies of the subject philosophy, what are the neighbors of the subject philosophy and what lies outside the subject philosophy. The core, the core of the building called philosophy consists of metaphysics, epistemology, logic and ethics. We have two courses each, metaphysics 1, metaphysics 2, epistemology 1, epistemology 2, logic 1, logic 2, ethics 1 and ethics 2. The balcony of the subject consists of the courses such as philosophy of science, philosophy of religion, philosophy of language, philosophy of education, philosophy of mind, philosophy of art and aesthetics, social and political philosophy and philosophy of law. The important thing about the balcony is, balcony belongs to the building. It, it facilitates you to look outside. The important aspect of balcony is that it not only looks outside, it also should look inside and work to calibrate between the outside and inside. The balcony is like the five senses of the body. The senses of our body are all located outside the body. And then they are not to be seen just outside, but they also have to calibrate what is inside. So that is the relation between the core and balcony of the subject in this architecture that I have thought about with the team of uh, you know, people who are working uh, on this project. Now there is an outside to the subject called philosophy. In the outside you find disciplines such as science, religion, literature, society, politics, arts, etc. Now you might ask this question, what is the relation between outside and the subject called philosophy? Let me just take an example from Michel Foucault, one of the important French philosophers of 20th century. Foucault comes up with something very, very interesting. He says that social theorist, sociologist, till Durkheim converged on the idea of what brings people together, what is the core of society, why do people come together and form society. And the answers, though varied, okay, converged on one thing. What is the different answers that they give? Some said that it is because of justice, some people it is utility, somebody said it is a contract and things like that. But what is common to all of them, says Foucault is, they all have subscribed to convergence model of social formation. Okay, And Foucault comes up with a, a startlingly, a radically different explanation. So he says that societies are not formed by bringing people together on certain important fundamental issues, but by excluding certain people and retaining them physically inside, but mentally outside. That's the main way, way, of, way of looking at social formation, according to Foucault. You might agree with it, you might disagree with it. But the point that is important is that he is, as a philosopher, bringing a radically different way of looking at social formation. Philosophy is the one which can come with something like this. Having laid bare the 
architecture of the courses, let me look at what do these core subjects deal with briefly. Metaphysics deals with what is the nature of reality. Is it one or is it many? Are there many? Okay. What is an ultimate reality? What is the relation between what exists and what is not there? What is the relation between appearance and reality and things like that? Let us just take an example about the idea of non-being. Then there was neither ought nor not, nor air nor sky beyond. What covered all? In watery gulf profound, nor death was then, nor deathlessness, nor change or night and day. That one breathed calmly, self-sustained, not else beyond it lay, gloom hid in gloom, existed first, one sea, eluding view. Now look at what is happening here. This passage is saying that from non-being came being. And this becomes a very complicated philosophical problem, saying that how can being come from non-being? Okay, If things are heterogeneous or in Indian philosophy, they are governed by Asat Karyavada. Okay, how did this happen? It needs a, a particular kind of explanation. Okay, in contrast to this heterogeneous relation between being and non-being, you have in Taitriya Upanishad, from being came another being. That means the relation is not heterogeneous but homogeneous. Okay, so there is a being and from being came another being. Now look at the preoccupation of metaphysics is to find out what is the what is there which is called as ultimate existence, ultimate reality. There are different ways of looking at it in western philosophy. You have for instance pre-Socratic philosophers who contemplated on what is an ultimate reality and concluded arrived at various explanations. For some it is air, for others it is water, for others it is fire and things like that. Now the mode of philo uh, metaphysics changes from the pre-Socrates to the Socrates. When you come to Socrates, Socrates talks about how knowledge is nothing but recollection. But please remember in a very important move he adds an important variable namely the role of a midwife. That even though we already know we have a knowledge, we already have a knowledge but you need the help of a midwife to facilitate you to realize what you already know. So there is already a third party intervention and then you also have a, a different mode of philosophizing in the form of dialogue. The dialogues were not there in the pre-Socratic way of philosophizing. And from Socratic to Aristotle when you move, you find that Aristotle saying that knowing is natural to human being. But not just knowing, but also knowing and going beyond what he or she already knows. So the philosophical terminology that can broadly cover the metaphysical preoccupation is about what is pre-existence and what is post-existence and what is non-existence. So this can be broad preoccupation with metaphysics. When metaphysics deals with what is an ultimate reality, epistemology deals with different ways of knowing that reality. Do I know this reality through perception? I know. But is perception only way of knowing? Take the example of an object on the table. Now, do I perceive this table? Yes, I perceive this table. But did this object come into my perception when I came in contact with it or did it exist before me? That requires, in addition to perception, something else which is important to assist us in our you know, activity of knowing, which is the concern about epistemology. Logic, while epistemology tells us 
what are the ways of knowing, logic lays bare the formal structures of our knowledge. It gets the geometry of our thinking at various stages of this order, which is why there is a close relation between logic and order. Okay. There is also a close relation between logic and law, because law requires not only procedures, but also systematic way of arguing. Okay. That is an important thing. So, how does one look at things differently? For example, is it about saying you are wrong? Logic will say that no, just say that somebody is wrong is not enough. You have to give a logical justification for saying that somebody is wrong. So, that is why I often maintain that one of the unique fat, uh, features of philosophy as a subject is, in philosophy you can say anything, but the crux of the subject lies in demanding justification for what you say. You can say that this reality that you are seeing is unreal, but you have to give justification. Shankara and Plato gave the justification that the reality that you see is not real because it is not permanent. If it is not permanent, then I can't, I don't want to call it as real. So, that is the justification that they gave. So, justification and logical justification is the important aspect of philosophy and that gets covered in logic. As I said, logic deals with laying bare the formal structures of our knowledge. While logic looks at the formal object of philosophy, ethics looks more at the existential aspects of human beings. Ethics in the classical time tried to provide conditions to enable people to have proper knowledge. The job of ethics is to arrive at providing conducive conditions for people to have knowledge and live good life and also give justification for their conduct. But then this is not the only job of ethics. Ethics also provided critic of an order and one of the important examples comes straight from Socrates. Socrates was alleged to be the one who is questioning the conventional morality that was practicing at that time. So, ethics covers two important aspects. It is to provide a conducive atmosphere for a human being to have a good life and also to have a proper knowledge, but also to contest the existing morality and then come up with alternative moral uh, rules. So, let me just take a quickly look at the one of the ethical uh, principles namely deontology and teleology. Deontology argues that if I perform an action, the action is intrinsically good and I do not have to go outside this action to look for justification. Whereas, teleology argues that the justification for my action lies not only in my action, but in its consequences. For instance, you have something very interesting in uh, Socrates, where Socrates says that no, if I know something, I do it. And if I know and do not do it, according to him, then I do not know it. And this is by definition. In contrast, Aristotle says that there is a possibility of a variance between I, what I know and what I do. I know something, I do not do it now, but I will now try to you know improve and then do that thing. So, Aristotle accepts variance between knowing and doing. Now, let us look at some important um, issues which are uh, which might uh, uh, interest you in this context while doing the subject. One is somebody might ask this question, what is 2 plus 2? The answer is 4. But a philosopher sometimes asks this question, can ask this question, two drops of water and two drops of water, do they make four drops or one drop? So, these are the kind of questions that philosopher is capable of asking. The other kind of question that preoccupied the discussions in induction as in, in logic is, the question that is raised is, how do you know that sun will rise tomorrow in the east. And many of them argued that it will definitely rise because I have seen sun regularly without fail rising in the east. But then the counter can be that 
sun will rise tomorrow in the east is a universal statement that factors only the past and the present but then a universal statement also factors the future and if you don't know about the future how do you know that it is a universal statement so how can you go from past and present to future and make all now the trick here is somewhere else and what is the trick there will be a tomorrow and then sun will raise or not raise okay there will be tomorrow only if sun raises okay and the whole argument against this collapses because we have not factored something like that so the tomorrow is parasitical on sun raising if sun does not raise there will not be tomorrow and that needs to be factored take another example that if there is a village where nobody went to school do you call them illiterate take next stage a school comes in that village and some people go to the school and they become literate then in relation to the literate the people who have not gone to school becomes non literate so which came first literacy or illiteracy literacy came first and then illiteracy is postulated in relation to literacy but then what do you say are you making illiterate literate or preliterate literate you understand the kind of a complexity that is there in a very simple incident like this a philosopher is the one who can handle these questions in a diligent manner the main job of this program is to present to you both indian philosophy and western philosophy and then in the process work more on indian philosophical resources and try to bring them on par with the western protocols that's very important in the context of doing this i want to try the following one that before we add new material we need to factor what is already available so that we are not merely accumulating we are accumulating the knowledge has to be in a cumulative manner not mere assorted accumulation so i welcome you all to this um, uh, subject called philosophy and look forward to your reading the modules which we are going to present in this program thank you